Good evening, I'm David Branny with Lone Star College Systems. I have with me today Mary Alston, who is in the healthcare professional field. I'll be interviewing Mary and finding out some of the difficulties she's had in communication with her patients on an everyday basis. So Mary, how are you today? I'm fine, David, how are you? Good, thank you. Are you from currently Houston, Texas? No, I'm living here now, but originally I was born in Buffalo, New York, and I call Houston my second home because since I've been married, we've lived in Texas more than any other state. Good, so you like it here? It's barrel. In the summertime, not so. The rest of the year is fine. Right, this is actually my first year too, so I'm kind of learning the heat thing as it goes the along. The humidity can get you in trouble. <laughs> right. And what is your current job title called right now? Right now, I'm an emergency room staff nurse who does uh, any job, including triage, quite often in uh, an emergency room setting in a hospital. Okay. And how long have you had that job profession currently? Um, 18 years. 18 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, why did you choose that profession? I've always had a calling to help others. You know, even from when you were young, babysitting and taking care of kids, to I grew up around a lot of older family members always living in the house, so I think it was a natural to kind of be there to help, and, and uh, my mother always took care of them, even though she wasn't a registered nurse or anybody in the health field, but she took care of the elderly, so I kind of grew up kind of being her helper. And uh, I always had that calling, but when I got out of high school, everybody, had, all my friends seemed to be going into nursing, and I always wanted to do something different, so I didn't do it at that time. Okay, great. Uh, what year did you enter school for nursing? Well, I'm an older student. I was uh, 37 <laughs> when I went back. Okay. So after being out of high school for over 18 years, it was a challenging experience. Okay. And where did you go to school? I graduated from St. Petersburg Junior College in Florida. Florida. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long was schooling there? It was a two-year program, which normally took um, most of the students three to four years to complete. But I did mine in two and a half years. What made you uh, fast track? Well, I had applied and... Um, was on a waiting list. And I thought, well, that's great. The first time you apply, you get on a waiting list because nursing is a highly sought after career. Right. And Desert Storm has. So all the military who were going to be going had to go, you know, do their uh, duty with the military. So a slot opened up. So they called me, and people I was working for at the time said, don't pass up the opportunity. So I got in with nine college credit cards. Wow. So something that it turned out to be a nightmare got you in, which was good. Uh, did you have any difficulties at a little bit older of an age and going to school since you had a family at that time? It was challenging, but I think when you're an older student, you're more focused. Right. And luckily in our, my program was a smaller program with just the nursing. The average age was probably 30 to 35. Or they got a heavy bleed, you know, they cut themselves really bad in the bleeding. So we just never know. Got to be prepared for anything. But that's, that's the, that's the, uh, the, the, the dreadful rush I was talking about. Is it, you know, but you know, you can handle it. And you know, you got help because we, we all work as a team. You just, you know, a phone call away from getting help. But we had one night with one patient and he just sat down outside and couldn't get up and wasn't communicating with us. He talked about the communication. His body later says, I'm sick, I can't move. It's dark out there, I don't know what I'm doing. Got on my phone, I called for help. And we got help, we got him back. We figured out what was going on. He was diabetic, his sugar was low. And, you know, a few other things, but you know, once you got him back, you could, so that's what Treasure does. Initially, says this one needs to go back. So basically, is it, you know, about the next one who's the sickest to go back? And we have a criteria, of course, that we base it on. Take for case that patient you said you couldn't figure out what was going on with him mm -hmm. because of the language barrier. Did you feel yourself getting nervous because you couldn't figure it out at that scene you were at? Now, now actually, uh, you look at, uh, you're taught to look at your, um, we call our ABCs, your airway, your breathing, and your circulation. So when we can't communicate, we, we can still do the health part of it. You know, are they breathing? Uh, you know, is there circulation? Are they, are they, you know, not pale? Are they pale, clammy? Is their lips blue? You know, they might have an airway open, but the circulation's not going on. You know, they're not breathing well, they're choking. So you can look at those. And then you know how quickly do you need to intervene to get the language taken care of to take care of this patient. But if you know it's just a respiratory issue, often they come in and they're coughing and they can't catch air. 
well, you're going to stop treating them before you figure out everything else. Right. So that, that's where, you, where your training comes in. Experience and then, comes in. And experience is a big, okay. a big part of it because you've seen a lot and you see how quickly certain things can change. Um, so, you, you know, I always go on the side of caution. If I'm not sure, they'll hire one. You know, especially with kids, too. We get a lot of asthmatic kids coming. And if I'm not sure, or a lot of little ones, and they look okay, but something just tells you it's not quite right, I'm going to make them a higher level to get them back to the doctor to figure out what's going on. I'm not the doctor. Right. Uh, I just do basically focus on who goes back when. And if something changes, I tell them to come tell me. And it can always change. You know, somebody could be okay, they're getting sicker. You know, a lot of diabetics, and a lot of diabetics out there today, so a lot of times their sugars will change. So we'll check it again. And that's one thing you can do in triage, and check the finger stick sugar. And you know, if one time it's like, you know, 150, he's okay. Next thing you know, he's been vomiting more. Now it's down to, to 40. Okay, now he needs to go back. He doesn't need to wait any longer. So that's what triage kind of does. Keep, keep everybody in an appropriate line. And you know, I got so many rooms. Some people have to wait. And that's what you constantly be assessing. So your assessment skills, your communication, and your experience. I say those three things that keep you in check. It, yeah, it really seems, <clears throat> talking with you this brief amount of time, that I've kind of learned your experience plays hand in hand with communication. And you know, if you can't get past that person, mm -hmm. you, you use your experience on how their reactions are to get through. And sometimes it's just as simple as calming the parents down. You know, because they walk in and they think they have a very ill child. And if you can just calm them down and tell them things that, that show the kid's okay. You know, he, he may be ill. I'm not disputing the fact that you're ill. Right. But looking at what I've just done, I've checked his vital signs, like his temperature, his pulse. You know, he's breathing. I've listened to his lungs. If you calm down, the kid's going to calm down and not be as irritable. As a, you know, uh, a, a colicky baby can be frustrating to parents. Uh, they calm them down. So you sort of think you look at the whole family, the whole picture, then they're not so anxious and they're not going to be um, as critical of everything up way having to wait. Because they think their kids are most important. And I understand that and I, and I respect that. But you got to kind of reassure them that it's okay. We'll get to you as soon as we can. But if you notice something different, come back and I'll recheck. Um, but they have to kind of let you lead them a little bit and guide them. Because, you know, I had one, one the other day, they were very anxious like in the end. I actually triaged them ahead of a couple other people that looked okay. And that's where your quick look comes in. Right. You know, three minutes. And then uh, afterwards, you know, they left in. And I asked them, I said, oh, you're doing okay? You look calmer now. And they were very thankful. You know, so I was like, okay, I felt I communicated well. You know, and I assessed them and got them taken care of. So communication isn't just by word. It's your actions, your interpretation of things. Uh, and then, you know, that, that's one nice thing. Sometimes you see them leave, and then you can follow up. And that's why I get my completion when you're in triage, because you don't see them when they go back. You're not taking okay. care of them. Right. But your completion is when you see them come out and they're, and they're like, oh, my pain's all gone, or you know, I'm feeling much better. You get a little bit of completion from that, knowing that you started the process, you got them on their way, and now they're done. So that's a nice thing to see them. Everybody doesn't get to go home, but it's nice to see them. Especially when the family's been real anxious and they come out, oh, thank you so much. I can go home and rest now. That's a nice thing. Right. So even, even with somebody you can't communicate with through language, when you see them come out that room, you just you see the body language mm -hmm. and their expressions on their face that shows you that they've yeah. really been taken care of and in the midst of the difficulties, which could be critical, right. life or death, mm -hmm. they've gotten past that right. and now you see the end result. Well, someone with belly pain, a lot of times they're hunched over, you know, they're not walking like they're holding it, not about they're walking just fine, you know, they're struggling. Like, I feel so much better. <laughs> so, you know, they may not be smiling because they're tired, especially in the middle of the night, but you can tell with their body language, they've got an improvement, and they, they've got what they came for, you know, that they've been evaluated, they've been treated, and they feel hopefully on the road to recovery. So that, that's a nice film, you know, okay, we've done our part. We can't fix everything in the ER, and as we try to tell them, we're not your family doctor. We can't fix everything, um, but we can help you, help you get on the track. So that's all, that's all you can do. You know, I'm still a little learning this whole process, but there's not like a, a, a stick it note that's on the wall that says, here's the high line for, for language. Like, where do you get that information when you're coming in as a new nurse? Um, basically, it's on our telephones. We do actually have a sticker with the number. Oh, it really on is. The phone. And then we do have a log of numbers also. But they do try to put it right there so it's readily available. I think 